Part one of chapter two of Stories of Animal Sagacity. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. Stories of Animal Sagacity by W. H. G. Kingston. Chapter two, part one. Dogs. We now come to the noble dog, endued by the creator with qualities which especially fit him to be the companion of man. Such he is in all parts of the world, and although wild dogs exist, they appear, like savage human beings, to have retrograded from a state of civilization. The mongrels, and the curs too, have evidently deteriorated and lost the characteristic traits of their nobler ancestors. What staunch fidelity, what affection, what courage, what devotion and generosity does the dog exhibit? Judged by the anecdotes I am about to narrate of him, a few only of the numberless instances recorded of his wonderful powers of mind, he must, I think, be considered the most sagacious of all animals, the mighty elephant not excepted the dog roswell i will begin with some anecdotes which i myself able to authenticate foremost must stand the noble roswell who belonged to some connections of mine he was a great size a giant of the canine race of a brown and white color one of his parents having seen the light in the frozen regions of greenland among the eskimos Roswell, though a great favorite, being too large to be fed in the house, had his breakfast, consisting of porridge, in a large wooden bowl with a handle, sent out to him every morning, and placed close to a circular shrubbery before the house. Directly it arrived, he would cautiously put his nose to the bowl, and if, as was generally the case, the contents were too hot for his taste, he would take it up by the handle and walk with it round the shrubbery at a dignified pace, putting it down again at the same spot. He would then try the porridge once more, and if it were still too hot, he would again take up the bowl and walk round and round as before till he was satisfied that the superabundant caloric had been dissipated, when, putting it down, he would leisurely partake of his meal. Everything he did was in the same methodical, civilized fashion. One of the ladies of the family had dropped a valuable bracelet during a walk. In the evening, Roswell entered the house and proceeded straight up to her with his mouth firmly closed. "'What have you got there?' she asked, when at once he opened his huge mouth and revealed the missing bracelet." The same lady was fond of birds, and had several young ones brought to her from time to time to tame. Roswell must have observed this. One day, he appeared again with his mouth closed and came up to her. On opening his jaws, which he allowed her to do, what was her surprise to see within them a little bird, perfectly unhurt. After this, he frequently brought her birds in his mouth which he had caught without in any way injuring them. He had another strange fancy. It was to catch hedgehogs, but instead of killing them, he invariably brought them into the house and placed them before the kitchen fire, supposing, apparently, that they enjoyed its warmth. With two of the ladies of the family, he was a great favorite and used to romp with them to his heart's content. The youngest, however, being of a timid disposition, could never get over a certain amount of terror with which his first appearance had inspired her. At length, Roswell disappeared. Although inquiries were everywhere made for him, he could not be found. It was suspected that he had been stolen with the connivance of one of the domestics who owed him a grudge. Weeks passed away, and all hope of recovering Roswell had been abandoned, when one day he rushed into the house, looking lean and gaunt, with a broken piece of rope hanging to his neck, showing that he had been kept endurance vile, and had only just broken his bonds. 
the two elder sisters he greeted with the most exuberant marks of affection leaping up and trying to lick their faces but directly the youngest appeared he slowly crept forward lay down at her feet wagging his tail and glancing up at her countenance with an unmistakably gentle look roswell not without provocation had taken a dislike to a little dog belonging to captain blank and at last having been annoyed beyond endurance he gave the small cur a bite which sent it yelping away captain blank was passing at the time and angry at the treatment his dog had received declared that he would shoot roswell if it ever happened again knowing that captain blank would certainly fulfill his threat the elder lady who was of determined character and instigated by regard for roswell called the dog to her and began belaboring him with a stout stick pronouncing the name of the little dog all the time roswell received the castigation with the utmost humility and from that day forward avoided the little dog never retaliating when annoyed and hanging down his head when its name was mentioned roswell had a remarkable liking for sugar plums and would at all times prefer a handful to a piece of meat if however a pile of them were placed between his paws and he was told that they were for baby he would not touch them but watch with wagging tail while the little fellow picked them up he might probably have objected had anyone else attempted to take them away gallant roswell he fell a victim at length to the wicked hatred of his old enemy the cook who mixed poison with his food which destroyed his life roswell's mistresses mourned for him as i dare say you will but they did not seek to punish the wicked woman as she deserved what a noble fellow he was how submissive under castigation how gentle when he saw that his boisterous behavior frightened his young mistress how obedient to command how strict in the performance of his duty and what self-restraint did he exercise think of him with baby's sugar plums between his paws not one would he touch my reader let me ask you one question are you as firm in resisting temptation as was gallant roswell he acted rightly through instinct but you have the power to discern between good and evil aided by the counsels of your kind friends do not shame the teaching of your parents by acting in any manner unworthy of yourself end of the dog roswell tyrell the dog which rang the bell I have told you of several cats which rang bells. Another connection of mine, living in the Highlands, had a dog called Tyrell. He had been taught to do all sorts of things, among others, to fetch his master's slippers at bedtime, and, when told that fresh peat was required for the fire, away he would go to the peat basket and bring piece after piece till a sufficient quantity had been piled up. He had also learned to pull the bell rope to summon the servant. This he could easily accomplish at his own home, where the rope was sufficiently long enough for him to reach. But on one occasion, he accompanied his master on a visit to a friend's house, where he was desired to exhibit his various accomplishments. When told to ring the bell, he made several attempts in vain. The end of the rope was too high up for him to reach. At length, what was the surprise of all present to see him seize a chair by the leg and pull it up to the wall when jumping up he gave the rope a hearty tug evidently very much to his own satisfaction you will generally find that difficult as a task may seem if you seek for the right means you may accomplish it drag the chair up to the bell rope which you cannot otherwise reach End of Tyrol, the dog which rang the bell. The Shepherd's Dog and the Lost Child I am sorry that I do not know the name of a certain shepherd's dog, but which deserves to be recorded in letters of gold. His master, who had charge of a flock, which fed among the Grampian Hills, set out from home one day, accompanied by this little boy, scarcely more than four years old. 
the children of Scottish shepherds begin learning their future duties at an early age. The day, bright at first, passed on when a thick mist began to rise, shrouding the surrounding country. The shepherd, seeing this, hurried onward to collect his scattered flock, calling his dog to his assistance and leaving his little boy at a spot where he believed that he should easily find him again. The fog grew thicker and thicker, and so far had the flock rambled that some time passed before they could be collected together. On his return to look for his child, the darkness had increased so much that he could not discover him. The anxious father wandered on, calling on his child, but no answer came. His dog, too, had disappeared. He had himself lost his way. At length the moon rose when he discovered that he was not far from his own cottage. He hastened towards it, hoping that the child had reached it before him. But the little boy had not appeared, nor had the dog been seen. The agony of the parents can be better imagined than described. No torches were to be procured, and the shepherd had to wait till daylight ere he could set out with a companion or two to assist him in his search. All day he searched in vain. On his return, sick at heart, at nightfall, he heard that his dog had appeared during the day, received his accustomed meal of a bannock, and then scampered off at full speed across the moor, being out of sight before anyone could follow him. All night long the father waited, expecting the dog to return, but the animal, not appearing, he again, as soon as it was daylight, set off on his search. During his absence, the dog hurried up to the cottage, as on the previous day, and went off again immediately he had received his bannock. At last, after this had occurred on two more successive days, the shepherd resolved to remain at home till his dog should appear, and then follow him. The sagacious animal, appearing as before, at once understood his master's purpose, and instead of scampering off at full speed, kept in sight as he led the way across the moor. It was then seen that he held in his mouth the larger portion of the cake which had been given him. The dog conducted the shepherd to a cataract, which fell roaring and foaming amid the rocks into a ravine far down below. Descending an almost perpendicular cliff, the dog entered a cavern, close in front of which the seething torrent passed. The shepherd, with great difficulty, made his way to it, when, as he reached the entrance, he saw his child unhurt, seated on the ground, eating the cake brought by the dog, who stood watching his young charge, thus occupied, with a proud consciousness of the important duty he had undertaken. The father, embracing his child, carried him up the steep ascent, down which it appeared he had scrambled in the dark, happily reaching the cave. This he had been afraid to quit on account of the torrent, and here the dog by his scent had traced him, remaining with him night and day, till, conscious that food was as necessary for the child as for himself, he had gone home to procure him some of his own allowance. Thus the faithful animal had, by a wonderful exercise of his reasoning power, preserved the child's life. End of The Shepherd's Dog and the Lost Child My Dog Out My dear friend gave me, many years ago, a rough white terrier puppy which I called Alp. I fed him with my own hand from the first, and he consequently evinced the warmest attachment to me. No animal could be more obedient, and he seemed to watch my every look to ascertain what I wished him to do. The expression of his countenance showed his intelligence, and whenever I talked to him, he seemed to be making the most strenuous efforts to reply, twisting about his lips in a fashion which often made me burst into a fit of laughter, when he would give a curious bark of delight, as much as to say, I, I can utter as meaning a sound as that. I felt very sure that no burglar would venture into the house while he was on the watch. I never beat him in his life, 
but once I pretended to do so with a hollow reed which happened to be in the room on his persisting, contrary to my orders, in lying down on the rug before the fire whenever my back was turned. As I was about to leave the room, I placed the reed on the rug and admonished him to be careful. On my return some time afterwards, I found the reed torn up in the most minute shreds. On looking round, I saw Alp in the furthest corner of the room, twisting his mouth, wriggling about, and wagging his tail, while every now and then he turned furtive glances towards the rug, telling me as plainly as if he could speak, I could not resist the temptation. I did it, I own, but don't be angry with me. You see, I have now got as far away from the rug as I could be. Alp, seeing me laugh, rushed from his corner to lick my hand. He ever afterwards, however, avoided the rug. For his size, he was the best swimmer and diver among dogs I ever saw. He would, without hesitation, plunge into water six or eight feet deep and bring up a stone from the bottom almost as big as his head, or dash forth from the sea beach and boldly breast the foaming billows of the Atlantic. After seeing what Alp did do, and feeling sure of what he could have done had circumstances called forth his powers, I am ready to believe the accounts I have heard of the wonderful performances of others of his race. A young Newfoundland dog, living in Glasgow a few years ago, acted under similar circumstances, very much as Alp did, as he sometimes misbehaved himself. A whip was kept near him, which was occasionally applied to his back. He naturally took a dislike to this article, and more than once was found with it in his mouth, moving slyly towards the door. Being shut up at night in the house to watch it, he and his rounds discovered the detested instrument of punishment. To get rid of it, he attempted to thrust it under the door. It stuck fast, however, by the thick end. A few nights afterwards, he again got hold of the whip and persevered till he shoved through the thick end when someone passing by carried it off. On being questioned as to what had become of the whip, he betrayed his guilt by his looks and slunk away with his tail between his legs. End of My Dog, Alp the dog and the thief a gentleman who lived near sterling possessed a powerful mastiff one evening as he was going his rounds through the grounds he observed a man with a sack on his back suspiciously proceeding towards the orchard the dog followed crouching down while the man filled his sack with apples the dog waited till the thief had thrown the heavy sack over his shoulders holding on to the mouth with both hands when the man was thus unable to defend himself, the dog rushed forward and stood in front of him, barking loudly for assistance, and leaving him the option of dropping his plunder and fighting for life and liberty, or of being captured. Paralyzed with fear, he stood still till the servants coming from the house made him prisoner. Be calm and cool in the face of a foe. Remonstrate with a wrongdoer. Fly from tempters but you cannot be too eager and, and violent in attacking temptation immediately. It presents itself. End of The Dog and the Thief The Cleanly Dog A friend told me of another dog which had been taught habits of cleanliness that some young gentleman, accustomed to enter the drawing room with dirty shoes, might advantageously imitate. A shallow tub of water was placed in the hall near the front door. Whenever this well-behaved dog came into the house, if the roads were muddy from rain or dusty from dry weather, he used to run to the tub and wash his feet, drying them, it is to be presumed, on the doormat, before venturing into any of the sitting rooms to which he had admission. End of the Cleanly Dog Master Ruff Having mentioned this cleanly dog, I must next introduce you to a canine friend called Master Ruff, belonging to my kind next-door neighbors, and I think you will acknowledge that he surpasses the other in the propriety of his behavior. 
Master Ruff is very small, and his name describes his appearance. As I hear his voice, I might suppose him to be somewhat ill-natured. Did I not know that his bark is worse than his bite? He is only indignant at being told by his mistress to do something he dislikes. But he does it notwithstanding, though he has, it must be confessed, a will of his own, like some young folks. He does not often soil his dainty feet by going out into the muddy road, but when he does, on his return he carefully wipes them on the doormat. At meal times he goes to a cupboard, in which is kept a bowl and napkin for his especial use. The napkin he first spreads on the carpet, and then, placing the bowl in the center, barks to give notice that his table is ready. After this, he sits down and waits patiently till his dinner is put into the bowl, on which he falls to and gobbles it up, the tablecloth preventing any of the bits which tumble over from soiling the carpet. It has been asserted that he wipes his mouth afterward in the napkin, but I suspect that he is merely picking up the bits outside. I am sorry to say that he forgets to fold up his tablecloth neatly and to put it away, which he certainly should do. Nor can he be persuaded to wash out his bowl, though he does not object to lick it clean. People and dogs, however, have different ways of doing things, and Master Ruff chooses to follow his way and is perfectly satisfied with himself, like some young folks who may not, however, be right for all that. His principal other accomplishment is to carry up the newspaper, after it has been read by the gentleman downstairs, to his mistress in the drawing room, when he receives a cake as his reward. He also may be seen carrying a basket after his mistress with a biscuit in it, which he knows will be his in due time, but that if he misbehaves himself by gobbling it greedily up, as he has sometimes done, I hear, he will have to carry the basket without the biscuit. So having learned wisdom from experience, he now patiently waits till it is given to him. If Master Ruff is not so clever as some dogs I have to tell you about, he does his best in most respects, and I am very sure that no thief would venture to break into the house in which he keeps watch, so that he makes himself what all boys and girls should strive to be, very useful. End of Master Ruff Byron the Newfoundland Dog Next on my list of canine favorites stands a noble Newfoundland dog named Byron, which belonged to the father of my friend, Mrs. F. On one occasion, he accompanied the family to Dawlish, on the coast of Devonshire, his kennel was at the back of the house. Whenever his master was going out, the servant loosened Byron, who immediately ran round, never entering the house, and joined him, accompanying him in his walk. One day, after getting some way from home, his master found that he had forgotten his walking stick. He showed the dog his empty hands and pointed towards the house. Byron, instantly comprehending what was wanted, set off and made his way into the house by the front door through which he had never passed. In the hall was a hat stand with several walking sticks in it. Byron, in his eagerness, seized the first he could reach and carried it joyfully to his master. It was not the right one, however. Mr. Blank, on this, patted him on the head, gave him back the stick, and again pointed towards the house. The dog, apparently considering for a few moments what mistake he could have made, ran home again and exchanged the stick for the one his master usually carried. After this, he had the walking stick given to him to carry, an office of which he seemed very proud. One day, while thus employed, following his master with stately gravity, he was annoyed during the whole time by a little yelping cur jumping up at his ears. Byron shook his head and growled a little from time to time, but took no further notice, and never offered to lay down the stick to punish the offender. On reaching the beach, Mr. Blank threw the stick into the waves for the dog to bring it out. 
Then, to the amusement of a crowd of bystanders, Byron, seizing his troublesome and pertinacious tormentor by the back of his neck, plunged with him into the foaming water, where he ducked him well several times, and then allowed him to find his way out the best he could, while he himself, mindful of his duty, swam onward in search of the now somewhat distant walking stick, which he brought to his master's feet with his usual calm demeanor. The little cur never troubled him again. Be not less magnanimous than Byron when troublesome boys try to annoy you whilst you are performing your duties, but employ gentle words instead of duckings to silence them. Drown the yelping curs, bad thoughts, unamiable tempers, temptations, and such like, which assault you from within. End of Byron, the Newfoundland Dog The Newfoundland Dog and the Marked Shilling I must now tell you a story which many believe, but others consider too good to be true. A gentleman who owned a fine Newfoundland dog, of which he was very proud, was one warm summer's evening riding out with a friend, when he asserted that his dog would find and bring him any article which he might leave behind him. Accordingly, it was agreed that a shilling should be marked and placed under a stone, and that after they had proceeded three or four miles on the road, the dog should be sent back for it. This was done. The dog, which was with them, observing them place the coin under the stone, a somewhat heavy one. They then rode forward the distance proposed, when the dog was dispatched by his master for the shilling. He seemed fully to understand what was required of him, and the two gentlemen reached home, expecting the dog to follow immediately. They waited, however, in vain. The dog did not make his appearance, and they began to fear that some accident had happened to the animal. The faithful dog was, however, obedient to his master's orders. On reaching the stone, he found it too heavy to lift, and while scraping and walking away, barking every now and then in his eagerness, two horsemen came by. Observing the dog thus employed, one of them dismounted and turned over the stone, fancying that some creature had taken refuge beneath it. As he did so, his eye fell on the coin, which, not suspecting that it was the object sought for, he put into his breeches' pockets before the animal could get a hold of it. Still wondering what the dog wanted, he remounted his steed with his companion and rode rapidly on to an inn nearly twenty miles off, where they purposed passing the night. The dog, which had caught sight of the shilling as it was transferred to the stranger's pocket, followed them closely and watched the sleeping room into which they were shown. He must have observed them take off their clothes, and seen the man who had taken possession of the shilling hang his breeches over the back of a chair. Waiting till the travelers were wrapped in slumber, he seized the garment in his mouth, being unable to abstract the shilling, and bounded out of the window, nor stopped till he reached home. His master was awakened early in the morning by hearing the dog barking and scratching at his door. He was greatly surprised to find what he had brought, and more so to discover not only the marked shilling, but a watch and a purse besides. As he had no wish that his dog should act the thief, or that he himself should become the receiver of stolen goods, he advertised the articles which had been carried off, and after some time the owner appeared, when all that had occurred was explained. The only way to account for the dog not at first seizing the shilling is that, grateful for the assistance afforded him in removing the stone, he supposed that the stranger was about to give him the coin, and that he discovered his mistake when it was too late. His natural gentleness and generosity may have prevented him from attacking the man and trying to obtain it by force. Patiently and perseveringly follow up the line of duty which has been set you. When I see a boy studying hard at his lessons, or doing his duty in any other way, I can say, ah, uh, he is searching for the marked shilling, and I am sure he will find it. End of the Newfoundland Dog and the Marked Shilling
the lost keys many species of dogs appear like the last mentioned to be especially endued with the faculty of distinguishing their master's property and to possess the desire of restoring it to them when lost mrs f told me of an instance of this with which she was acquainted a gentleman residing in the county of cork finding his outhouses infested by rats sent for four small terriers to extirpate them he amused himself with teaching the dogs a variety of canine accomplishments among others to fetch and carry whatever he sent them for returning one day from his daily walk he discovered that a bunch of keys which he supposed was in his pocket was not there hoping that he might have left them at home he made diligent search everywhere but in vain one of the little terriers had observed his master thus searching about and there can be no doubt that, after pondering the matter in his mind, he came to the conclusion that something was lost. Be that as it may, off he set by himself from the house, and after the lapse of some hours, up he came running with eager delight, the lost keys dangling from his mouth and jingling loudly as he gambled about in his happiness. He then dropped them at his master's feet. We may be sure that the dog was well caressed and became from thenceforward the prime favorite. That terrier was a little dog, but still he was of much use, not only by killing rats, which was his regular duty, but by trying to find out what his master wanted to have done and doing it. Little boys and girls may be of still greater use if they will both perform their regular duties and try to find out what there is to be done, and then, like the terrier, do it. End of the Lost Keys The Dog Which Acted as Constable Mrs. F. told me another anecdote which illustrates the fidelity and reasoning power so frequently exhibited by the shepherd's dog. About the year 1827, her father sold some lambs to a butcher in Melrose, who took them away in his cart. Their shepherd had a young dog in training at the time. Shortly after the sale of the lambs, he missed this dog, and hastened in search of him. On reaching the chain bridge, which is thrown over the river for the use of foot passengers, he was told that the dog had been seen standing on it, watching the butcher's cart containing the lambs, which was crossing the ford beneath. As soon as it had gained the other bank, the dog followed it to Melrose. The shepherd pursued the supposed truant till he reached the town, where, in front of the butcher shop, stood the cart with the lambs still in it, and the dog standing like a constable by it, threatening every one who approached to unload it. He had evidently considered that the animals were stolen, and that it was his duty to keep watch over them. When, however, his master appeared and called him away, he seemed at once to understand that it was all right, and followed him willingly. Be watchful over whatever is committed to your charge, and be equally watchful over yourself. End of the dog which acted as constable. End of part one of chapter two of stories of animal sagacity.